call themselves the Guardians of the Galaxy. What a bunch of a-holes. Ah, I'm hooked on a feeling. I'm high on believing.
Project Black Sky. And uh, with us today, we've got a stellar moderator who's, uh, who's an awesome writer and editor for a site called Multiversity Comics. Uh, and I will introduce him now, Matt Malikov, to take over. Cool. Hello, everybody. Thank you. So we're here to talk about Project Black Sky with all of your favorite Project Black Side Dark Horse superhero creators. Uh, let's go down the line and clap for all of them, one at a time. We're going to start with uh, Frank Barbier of... Blackout. Thank you. <laughs> and it's Barbary. Come on. Is it? Yeah. Okay, it's yeah, Frank awesome. Barbary. I don't know how to Blackout. say your last name. So, so now we clap for him. <laughs> uh, next is Josh Williamson, Captain Midnight. Woo! Uh, we got Tim Seeley and Mike Norton of The Occultist. Hello. hello. We have got Chris Sabella of Ghost. We've got Fred Van Lenty of Brain Boy. And last but certainly not least, we have Joshua Hale Fialkov of Skyman. All right, so let's, let's get going with our nice little presentation here. So Project Black Sky is introduced in uh, Captain Midnight. It was created by the character Captain Midnight and some shifty government agencies, but in the future, in our present time, it's being misused. Is that correct? Is that yeah. correct explanation of it? Uh, pretty much. Well, it, Black Sky came to uh, Captain Midnight in the late 30s, early 40s, and asked him to help them develop some of the technology they had found. And that's how he actually started making like the Captain Midnight wings and became Captain Midnight. When Captain Midnight uh, was trapped in the Bermuda Triangle and then eventually arrived in present day, uh, Black Sky, in the time he was gone, went from being just a few men in black sort of agents to a very shadowy uh, agency, like a rogue agency in the government. Yeah. <clears throat> and now it's... And they uh, love markers, apparently. And they, they do love markers. And they're going to kill Josh, for saying. And they're going to kill you. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry, Josh. I'm so sorry. You saw what happened on Twitter. Come on. I did. I did. Um, but now, with the next arc of Captain Midnight, what? we're going to start ramping things up a bit, right, Josh? Because we've got yeah. the Helios arc coming up after the. Yeah, this is. Uh, are we allowed to spoil the issue? Issue nine. Happened? Yeah, yeah. I, I okay. We can yeah. talk about issue nine. It just came out this week. I mean, nice. but yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so what's going on right now, Captain Midnight? Is we're doing. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Uh, we're starting the Better Tomorrow arc of the book. Uh, with issue 9, that'll run through 9 through 11, and essentially what's been going on in the book is yeah, this build up to Captain Midnight kind of not confronting his enemies head on because of um, things in the way. Like basically he knew he couldn't go after Fury Shark, who is his arch enemy's daughter, because of uh, her connections with the government. And eventually he's got fed up with it and he wanted to know what had happened to his old sidekick, uh, Chuck Ramsey. And so with this arc, with issue 9, he goes after Fury. Um, and finally actually arrests her, which was, the, which was the assignment he had when he went through the Bermuda Triangle back in the 40s. So he was finally able to finish that last big mission that he was trying to do. But then something happens in issue nine that kind of sets the book on a different course. Mm -hmm. um, something happens to Fury that is pretty bad. And now he has to deal with Helios and with uh, Chuck Ramsey. And what's been interesting, I think, about Captain Midnight <clears throat> is you've, you've taken this book and all like the old original mm -hmm. kind of characters and then updated it both with a brand new team yeah. and keeping in all the old characters. One thing that Fury uh, says on issue nine is uh, she points something out. It's, I guess it could be meta, I suppose, but she sort of points out that Cap had rebuilt his family from um, the, you know, the World War II time period. He basically got surrogates for each member of that team. Um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, it's been fun like with all the old stuff from back in the day, like in, in the first issue, Ivan Shark was eaten by polar bears. And that really happened. Like that, or that really happened back then. That's how Ivan Shark died. I just kind of made it much more brutal. Um, yeah, when I was going everything, that was one thing that I was like, I am keeping this. <laughs> like if we can have him get eaten by polar bears, I'm totally gonna keep it. Um, but it's been a lot of fun sort of updating that stuff and keeping um, it in, in theme with it. And one thing I've been really happy about is hearing from like older fans of Captain Midnight, how they really do feel like it's a continuation. Um, Hannah, uh, Hannah Means Shannon, right? She wrote, uh, like totally surprised us today, but she wrote this really awesome story about her and her family and Captain Midnight on Bleeding Cool today. I guess what had happened was she had, uh, did you read that? Yeah, yeah. Dude, it was awesome, awesome. man. She, uh, she was reading Captain Midnight for work and she was talking to her mom and they were just talking about stuff in, in comics, and, and uh, Hannah asked her mom, like, have you ever heard of Captain Midnight before? 
and her mom had. She like was a, a fan and loved all this old Cats Midnight stuff. And so they ended up having, like Hannah was saying in the article, like she's never had a conversation about comics with her mom before until this. Like she had no idea her mom was a Captain Midnight fan and they ended up having this whole conversation. And uh, her mom was like, I haven't thought of Captain Midnight in probably 60 years. You know, it was like when I was a kid, and uh, she just went on this whole thing about it. It was a really great article about it, but it was really cool that uh, Hannah went and got the old books and was talking to her mom and then reading the new series and, and realizing how much, like, work we put in to make sure that if you're a fan of the old stuff, you could read it, but if you're starting with issue one, you don't know anything, you're still able to pick it up and, and follow the book. And I, I, I do want to point out, uh, you know, the original Ivan Fury was eaten by a polar bear, and you almost had his daughter uh, eaten by a shark in the yeah. latest issue. I think that was, that was very uh, good. That was one of those things that uh, came about because I, something I never realized with issue, I think it was issue one. Um, in issue one, there's a scene of, of Fury's office, and I was reading the issue again, like just looking through it, and I realized that uh, Fernando had drawn a shark tank under her office. Like I never saw that, and it was in the <laughs> script. And so when I was working on issue nine, I was like, we're going into that shark tank. <laughs> like, like something's gonna happen and those sharks are gonna come out. And yeah, he draws, man, the, the whole shark take sequence is awesome. It's, I love that whole part. So now we have Chekhov's gun and Williamson's shark tank. Yeah, okay. <laughs> excellent. Um, all right, well do you wanna- those covers, yeah. Yeah, right. uh, we got some covers for upcoming issues. The one on, on nine the and ten, left yeah. here is the most recent issue, that's mm -hmm. nine. Yeah, uh, we got ten. On yeah, it was the right Rick here. and Cap. Yeah, ten is one of my nine. Nine through eleven is some of my favorite things I've ever written. Like it's, I don't know, something like really clicked with those issues that I'm really happy with. I think it was because I had had, um, <laughs> um, I had basically got some motivation from Scott Alley about writing when I was working on those issues, and we were watching Breaking Bad at the same time, <laughs> and so I just felt like I needed to up it, up the ante a little bit. I watched, book. I watched Breaking Bad with you. That's right. Time. Yeah. I came all the way to Portland so that I could watch Breaking Bad with you. <laughs> wow, so it was great. We had chips. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> and then that's, uh, that's 11 and 12. Because mm -hmm. something happens in this arc that causes Cap to sort of debate retiring. He kind of feels like he's a soldier that's come home from war and he is ready to start, to start a new life. Uh, it kind of takes him on a little bit of a dark path with the character for a few issues. He grows a beard. It's awesome. <laughs> you know a man is serious when he grows I think beard. pretty much everyone on this panel can endorse beards. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't even wear the suit. He doesn't wear the suit. <laughs> he doesn't wear the Captain Midnight suit for like four issues. It's going to be cool. Um, <laughs> and oh, and we can talk about Skyman now, What's which up? was uh, spun out of Captain yes. Midnight. And then uh, we, you basically recreated the, the character, uh, yeah, the brand new character. The, the, one of the really cool things that I don't know if it was Josh. I don't know if it was you, Williamson. I don't think I'm not going to give Josh credit. I think it was. I think it was the powers that be at Dark Horse. One of the ideas they had is to kind of uh, like unify a lot of the Golden Age stuff. Was this idea that there has been a series of Skyman? Yeah, that's, that's all Mike Richardson. That Skyman. Those. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, Josh gets nothing. Josh does nothing. I don't know what. I don't know what he does all day. Um, except for talk to me. It's weird. It's really sad. It's all we do. Um, so, you know, the idea was that there's been this kind of line of guys who have been, you know, black op superheroes. Um, and in Captain Midnight, Josh had, uh, had the current one lose his mind and try to commit essentially terrorism in the name of America on American, you know, on American Cause soil. Because he's a patriot. Shit, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we kind of took, I wanted to take that idea and sort of follow it through. You know, you have this secret program that's been going on and you have this kind of jingoistic, you know, uh, xenophobic <laughs> lunatic out there now suddenly not just exposing the program but exposing everything that's wrong with the program. Um, and so, you know, our story starts with him after he's essentially been, you know, uh, taken, off the f taken off the streets and told he's done. <clears throat> and he's in a bar getting drunk and getting more and more aggressive and more and more belligerent about um, not just the people around him, but uh, our president and because uh, he's a bigot. He's a bigot. At the yeah. end of the day, like he's 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 sees America through the kind of 1950s, those 1940s, 1950s glasses. Well, you know, he was sunglasses. supposed to be the the dark self sort of yeah. thing for a cat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he exposes himself as all those things, and the U.S. government suddenly has this huge problem, which is how do we put a good face on a secret black ops program where we have given a racist a super suit um, that gives him superpowers. Um, and so the government being uh, the government, their solution is we find an African-American and put him in the suit. 
Um, and so it's actually a story about this guy who's chosen kind of for the wrong reasons, but turns out to actually be the right guy. And so he gets to go on this journey as, as, as a man who's seen as something as simple as his race, that he was chosen just because he fit you know, a piece of paper. But that ultimately he is a hero, and ultimately he stamps, he steps up, and he brings you know honor and all that stuff to the name Skyman. And this is one of the first books that kind of started bridging things together because you'll have you'll have characters appear for like a panel, yeah. maybe. But this is the first spin-off <clears throat> of yeah, all of the of the Black Sky yeah. line. And like I said, stuff. I was joking, but Josh and I talk literally nonstop. So like <laughs> everything, really? I think everything I did, like Josh knew everything I was doing, and. He was kind of planting seeds for me and stuff to play with. Yeah. I mean, did you, uh, with creating the new character, obviously this is kind of a bit of a politically charged book. Was there anything in that that you were kind of worried about? Especially with the, the president actually appears in, in the comic book. Yeah. No, I don't. I mean, I, like, I, I think there's no point in doing safe comics, especially, you know, people, people have expectations for what you can do with superheroes and one of the kind of benefits of what of what dark horse is doing is that those expectations don't exist you know people people have expectations for what we do but we can break those expectations and we can do stuff that's different we can change these characters and we can build something if it makes a better story mm -hmm. and if it makes a more compelling universe and they're they're really open to that stuff and really flexible about that stuff and i also like the idea that you know captain midnight's created all of this technology mm -hmm. that can now be seeded really out through all the other books right. but this one in particular really kind of takes that and that runs with that as like right. a central aspect yeah when it's the idea that again the idea that you know the government as you know both in in the comic and in real life like the government builds weapons without thinking about the consequences you know whether it's giving <laughs> guns to iraq you know, 30 years ago, only to have them use those guns on us for the next 30 years. Like, it's, it's just sort of what we do. We side with, you know, we didn't like the Russians, so we made the Taliban. <laughs> like, that was what we did. Like, that's, that's history. Like, it's, it's just how things work. We side with whoever's beneficial to us at the time, and we look aside all of their shortcomings and moral failings until they come back and bite us on the ass. You know. So one one question that I would like to ask. Also, I, there's like shooting and flying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's all kinds of action. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of flying. One thing I would like to ask, and I think all of you guys could answer this. You know, socially conscious superheroes. Uh, I think oftentimes you get superheroes that are very kind of just you know idealistic fantasy mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. archetype things. But with all of these books together, all the ones that I've read, every single one seems to be pointing towards a specific place or idea or thing that you want to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you find that this is better for superheroes or worse based on kind of like that popular fantasy aspect? I think it's, I think it's a little easier in that you're not writing, you know, like when you're working at Marvel or DC, you have this giant universe and you spend a lot of time servicing that universe no matter how much you don't want to. We, even if it's ignoring stuff that's happening in other books, you still kind of have to make a point that you're ignoring the stuff in those other books. So there's a freedom in having a smaller line where you can just tell the stories you want mm -hmm. you know, and make each, each story compelling <laughs> and just the universe is easy enough to get into that you don't need you know, all that weight to kind of drag along behind you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like even with uh, the older characters, coming back everyone's reinvented them in a meaningful way and because they're not like Marvel DC characters that have these years of continuity we all have to find something specific to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's really showing through the whole line yeah. um, and I, I do want to we have a picture up here uh, on the right which is kind of the finale of mm -hmm. or it's where we left off spoilers don't look with uh, <laughs> Captain Midnight and Skyman Facing off, what are they called? The the black the, skymen. I call them the dark skymen. The dark yeah. skymen, right? Which is an army of yeah. half, like half finished skymen. Essentially, they all have their tech. Their, they have prototype belts that aren't actually finished. And they're all pretty deranged and yeah. angry and a little <laughs> racist. Yeah. Well, they all, you know, part of one of the things I like about it, it's not that they're. I actually don't think it's that they're racist. Is the idea is that, you know, the 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 guy who's kind of evolved in the antagonist is uh, is skyman's handler. And he was next in line. Like he was told, he was being trained and groomed to become the next guy, and then has that job taken away from him. You know, for reasons that have nothing to do with him. Like he's not inherently a bad guy. Like he earned this thing. He worked his whole life. You know, he's worked his whole life towards this moment, only for them to say like, "Well, we're gonna go get this other guy just you know so it looks better for us." 
Um, and so it's not coming from a place of evil. It's not coming from a place of, of, of even hate necessarily. Like he's, he's not wrong. Like it's not a good situation for anybody. Like everyone's in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the thing. I think the way to go back to your first question about how you deal with race in a way that's not, you know, offensive or that's, that's quote unquote delicate is that each one of these characters are dealing with them as people. You know, each one has to deal with the expectations that's put upon them by who they are and how they cope with it. And everyone copes with it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, hopefully that's why, that's why it works. Did I, well, did I ever tell you that I want to bring back the original Skyman? I want to call, yeah. what, do you remember what I wanted to call him? I don't him? remember. Right wing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get that one by. We'll see what happens. There was a Captain America bad guys, right wing and left winger. Remember those guys? Oh, yeah. yeah, they were like, well, that makes sense for Captain America, I think, too. <laughs> I think yeah. everything. Oh, that's from yeah. um, so we have another teaser here for the upcoming arc yeah. of uh, Captain Midnight. Yeah, a lot of bad I, stuff I, think the, I think the general vibe you're going for is dark. <laughs> yeah, well, I always like, uh, like the hero's journey, and I feel like we're getting to that part where Cap is going to have to go to his, you know, the darkest part of it for a little bit. All right, and we have another teaser here for uh, what is one. the Project Black Sky. I mean, do you guys want to tell us yet, or do you want to keep it on the down low? Oh, what Black Sky is? Of the well, truth? Well, I, I think we're building towards Free Comic Book Day, and, and a lot of awesomeness will be unleashed. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in the, the, the Free Comic Book Day book, which teams up Captain Midnight and Brain Boy, but, but elsewhere, perhaps, on the interwebs <laughs> that I hear the kids like. Right, there's the two websites for this as well. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds those, of those things. And it will have more things okay. that are cool, <laughs> you know? With lots of black marker, right? <laughs> and maybe pictures of cats, I don't know. No, I'm seeing <laughs> cats. All right, so I think, that's, I think it's a good segue to talk about Brain Boy. Okay. Uh, the, the first arc has wrapped. Yes. Uh, we're we're on, coming towards the second arc. Can you tell us a little bit about it, please? Yeah, uh, we're doing this in a series, miniseries. Next miniseries is, is Brain Boy versus the men from Gestalt which is this uh, mysterious organization that seems to be trying to merge all of the psychics in the world into one. And uh, Matt gets involved with them. It gets involved with this crazed uh, doomsday prepper camp that's sending threats against the president. And because Brain Boy's primary uh, employers are the Secret Service, he gets sent out to investigate this, this hive of, of radicalism and stumbles across a massive conspiracy that may or may not involve our good personal friends at Project Black Sky. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so it, it was sort of set up in the first arc, and then uh, uh, this arc is pretty awesome. And uh, what's terrific is the guy who sort of co-created the strip with me in Dark Horse Presents, uh, Freddie Williams, is coming back to draw uh, the sequel, oh, awesome. which is super, super awesome. And I, I remember in the first Brain Boy, there are a couple seeds, uh, you know, all right industries. Right. Makes an appearance. Yep. Uh, but what I found not notable about Brain Boy is it, uh, I think out of all the Project Black Sky books, this one was, the, I think, the most humorous. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, the other ones are a little bit dark, certainly. But this one, the character certainly found some kind of Well, humor. it is named Brain Boy. Right. So, I mean, and it, and only... it, that became like the recurring gag and that he didn't want to be called yeah. it until the end of the story. Yeah. Plus, the villain was basically like psychic Fidel Castro. Right. Psychic <laughs> Hugo Chavez. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, I mean, the original Brain Boy, uh, like Captain Midnight, is one of these sort of forgotten characters. You know, <laughs> Brain Boy certainly was more forgotten than Captain Midnight, but Brain Boy was this crazy series in, that Dell Comics did in the early 60s that um, uh, they did when they lost a lot of their superheroes to, to Western publishing. And so they, they, Marvel was getting big at that time, so they tried to do a bunch of superhero concepts. And Brain Boy was, without a doubt, one of, one of the craziest things I've ever read. <laughs> um, and Dell, because they used to have the Disney license, they, did not, they weren't part of the comics code. This is sort of a sort of fascinating aspect of comics history. Mm -hmm. And so Brain Boy was unusually uh, batshit crazy, because <laughs> they did not have to adhere to any of the weird. So Brain Boy like, killed people and, with his mind and, and made them shoot each other and, and, and did all this kind of really bizarre stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's and still so a little bit of that in the... Oh, there's a lot of yeah. that, yeah. We don't follow the comics code either, so we, right. we, have, we, have, we have even more freedom. Uh, and it, it certainly seems like this, this next arc of Brain Boy kind of ups the ante as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, um, we've, we've thrown some preview pages up here for you. Yes, that is a mysterious entity attacking the White House, which may or may not have to do with these, uh, these folks hiding out in a 
in, a, in an abandoned Titan missile silo outside mm-hmm. Albuquerque. Uh, but yeah, so Freddie had a lot of fun with this. It's, it's amazing how much reference you can get right. to the snipers on top <laughs> of the White House. Real <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> life reference. And, and can you tell us a bit about the Free Comic Book Day? <laughs> yeah, uh, Free Comic Book Day uh, is a story, as I said before, that teams up um, Captain Midnight and, and Brain Boy. They get sent by the president off to do... S- uh, to stop a, a biological weapon that has escaped from Project uh, Black Sky uh, by the code name of, of Apex, and they find out that Apex is a is a talking psychic teleporting gorilla because we need more super apes in in comics, uh, and so it's uh, it's Rainbow Boy and, and Cat Midnight fighting apes, um, and, and so it's, it's awesome and it's free, so it means yeah. it makes it twice as awesome. <laughs> Say they go bananas. Yeah, I love that script, man. <laughs> Thank you. That yeah, was yeah. so good. <laughs> it was super it was, like, fun. It was super fun to do. Yeah. And what's great is, is I, I keep... Uh, Nate Picos, uh, you know, one of the best letters in the business, Nate Picos is doing, I think, I don't know how many of our books. He's certainly doing a lot of our books. All. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I keep trying to destroy <laughs> him because, by coming up with crazy stuff. That, so, <laughs> so, like, in the original Brain Boy series, like... The great thing about Nate is he's a, he's a terrific cartoonist as well. So we had, like, you know, it's like... Brain Boy's stuck in traffic, and all these, the, the other motorists have all these, these balloons, and they've got, like, you know, all this funny... So, so the thoughts are being represented graphically, and, and Apex actually speaks in sign language, and <laughs> Nate came up with a sign language font. Wow. Uh, and so it's pretty awesome, and I'm just waiting for him to kill me. I keep coming up with crazy <laughs> stuff for him to do. But right. he's taken everything in stride so far. It's been, it's been awesome. Good. So now let's talk about The Occultist. Right. This is Tim and Mike. Uh, and this actually, this was a mini before I think anyone had even heard of Project Black Sky. You yeah, guys, you guys did a series together. Yeah, well, we did the first series, and then uh, Mike and I did the most recent one. Um, we're kind of the most peripheral of the Black Sky books, yeah. um, largely because it wasn't kind of conceived at the same time as the other stuff being tied together. Uh, but Occultist is about a uh, <laughs> a, a kid who becomes a bearer of this uh, spell book called the Sword, basically. And he, uh, it's basically Doctor Strange uh, if he were Peter Parker. It's kind of the pitch that Mike and I always use for it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's really like crazy high magic stuff. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, it was still, I think, entertaining the way, and you guys have obviously worked together for a while now. I mean, how's the collaboration changing between, you know, you also do Revival together, for example. Well, this was this. like Mike's break from Revival, because Revival, Mike has to draw like old people sitting around eating pie and stuff. <laughs> and then this, I'm like, draw a crazy ass army of undead people. And, you know, this was like his little break between the heavy. Uh, Bumblebees riding tricycles. Yeah, that was, yeah. We don't have that in Revival usually too much, no, but uh, no. in this we did. But yeah, so in this we, we were telling our own sort of uh, story with it, called us, but um, there's a framing device that ties it back to Project Black Sky. Um, which right. It appears in the last issue. Yeah, yeah first on the issue, surface, last issue. he's not, I mean, his, his life has very little to do with all those. Uh, he's got his own thing going on in the astral plane but yeah. uh, the, he's he's being watched by by that group mm-hmm. and I, I like the way that you guys have been doing that like because we were saying earlier you know you'll get a panel and that panel may yeah. show like ghost or brain boy or something and it, you have these figures that are kind of tying everything together in the background and it's a very interesting way to build a superhero universe mm-hmm. you know it's not you, you guys aren't being excessive about it and we certainly have Skyman, which came out of Cat Midnight. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I mean, I really like I like the way that you guys. Yeah, I try and drop as much and try and sneak some stuff as, as much as I can, even to the point where I get in trouble. Right, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's stuff for another day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna talk with Chris about Ghost here. Ooh, these are these are the new covers because Chris is going solo on the book. 
starting with issue number five. What? And speaking of revival, there's Jenny Frizen of our book also. Yes. Yeah. I was very happy about that. She does nice stuff. Yes, she, she does. does. So, Chris, what can you tell us about what is coming for Ghost? Because uh, this is where the Project Black Sky stuff starts for her, right? Y yeah. Uh, the first arc, uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick and I co-wrote and was sort of uh, collecting all the pieces from that initial arc she did with Phil Noto. So we're kind of rebuilding her world. Um, and so this is where things start to align a little bit. Like, if you're familiar with everything, you could see the threads being drawn, but like if it's the only book of all of them that you're reading, it's still enjoyable on its own. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, basically in this new arc, uh, it's Ghost versus uh, Son of Svenguli, uh, or the like local TV horror host uh, who is uh, gathering a cult uh, to murder. Uh, and then there's a, a mystery dude who's sort of uh, lurking on the fringes, uh, and then so my job is to try and bring them all together so it actually makes logical sense. So you went full Chicago in this thing. Oh uh, yeah, I grew up in Chicago, so like when I got asked to join on the book, I was like, perfect. Like that's my childhood was spent like riding L trains, uh, picturing like superheroes running alongside, leaping from rooftop to rooftop, and I was like, and now I can finally write that scene. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm I'm basically abusing all my old Chicago knowledge for this. And, I, and if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, the first time we've seen pages from the new artist of the book as well. Yes, it's uh, it's Jander Sema who, yeah, awesome. uh, oh, cool. yeah, she's been drawing Star Wars books. Uh, and uh, like, so this is her first like non Star Wars book, and I don't know how long. Uh, and yeah, she's absolutely killing it. I was, uh, I haven't even seen these. I've only seen the pencils, uh, but the pencils were just like, oh, okay, like this is way more amazing than I ever expected. So, mm -hmm. it looks awesome. All right, blackout, Frank. This is the first new, brand new character. This is not a, a revived character for for the Project Blackout universe. Yes. <laughs> can, you talk, can you talk a bit about Blackout? <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun because uh, I knew Dark Rufus was doing a lot of the superhero stuff when my editor, Chris, and I started talking about this. And I was just kind of going through in my brain, like, oh, who am I going to get? Like, what am I going to have to read? Like, in an exciting way, though, because reading comics for research is always fun. But he's like, oh, we're making someone up. And that was both terrifying and fun. But, uh, it's really cool to write someone kind of dragged into the whole Black Skies drama, so to speak. And uh, we've really been doing a lot of fun stuff. And Blackout's power set involves him being able to open black holes that take him into a blackout dimension where he can see the real world, but he's not there. So he can walk through walls, he can walk through objects, and then reappear through another black hole, which is what's happening on the cover. And uh, for me, it's a lot of fun because we're finding cool ways to make that power exciting. It's fairly mundane if you think about it in a logistical sense, but it presents a really fun challenge because he has, specifically in this arc, he's going up against a few like guys in mecha suits, and there's a lot of really cool like tricks that Scott, who has the suit, is using, uh, learning to do. And uh, the character is in every man who's kind of thrown into this, the suit kind of just ends up in his control and he's learning as the reader's learning. So it's a really fun, organic way to start a story. And uh, issue one just came out last week. Right. Or and this week, excuse me, yeah. There are three Dark Horse Presents shorts that yeah, we, sort of set it up. We had had three Dark Horse Presents shorts, which uh, really directly lead us right to the point in issue one. And uh, I would highly recommend if you like the character, if you're interested, you get some of that Dark Horse Presents stuff. Uh, this is the stuff from issue one. Uh, we opened with a dream sequence, and Colin Lorimer is the artist on this, who did a phenomenal job. Uh, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and it's really cool to bring a new character out in that way. I spent a lot of time talking with my editor about who he is and how we're slowly going to grow the character and reveal more about him. And I don't know, I look forward to getting all four out. Uh, we also have, uh, in our book, the King Tiger backup, King Tiger being another mm -hmm. old Dark Horse character that they're bringing back. So it's a pretty cool double feature if you pick up Blackout. Blackout number one on sale at the signing after this event. <laughs> no, but it, in all honesty, it's been a lot, a lot of fun. It's an honor to bring a new character into Dark Horse and into this line where we have so much good history to mine from and a lot of really cool connective tissue as well. Uh, 
we're certainly getting there. And if you're attentive, there's a lot of stuff peppered into these issues where you'll be like, oh, that makes sense because that's a word I heard in Captain Midnight or that's a word I heard in Brain Boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was going to ask, is it more intimidating to bring a new character in for you? You don't have that safety net of people knowing who they are and people, as I found out, very much want to. So we're really starting from the ground level and hoping making someone who's compelling. And mm -hmm. it's funny because you spend so much time coming up with this character and talk so much and you know who they are and you start figuring out the best way to show that to readers. And uh, I think by the end of the miniseries, we're going to have a really good sense of who Scott is. Scott is the main character you see there who ends up with the blackout suit. Uh, what the suit can possibly do and how he's going to go about using it to get what he needs. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a preview of X, which is uh, written by Dwayne Swarzynski, who is not, unfortunately not here with us today. Uh, but this is still a, a pretty fun book, I think. Does everyone want to say their favorite part about <laughs> X? No? Well, always killing dudes. He, yeah, yeah. Bruno Bylis. <laughs> the whole, like, he meat industry well. stuff no. <laughs> was pretty awesome. I, I like the art. Um, the, oh, yeah. Oh, and this is the cover for the, uh, the, the upcoming free comic book day. Uh, but I do, I do want to ask you guys. So That's building Apex is the purple gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so building a new shared superhero universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously in comics, we're sort of used to you know, books connecting and being interwoven. But coming at it from the ground up, how have you guys been collaborating with one another to share your characters or to get them in each other's books in, in ways that you all feel are true to the characters that you're writing? Well, all the books have been super fun to read, and so really just research is a joy. I mean, we're all kind yeah. of scattered throughout the country, so it's, it's, it's a little tough to do, mm -hmm. you know, one-on-one -on -one collaboration, but, but as, the, as the line continues, you're going to see a lot more of that and a lot of more interconnections between the various books. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I talk to Fialkov on the phone we were saying every day, and I see uh, Sabella every once in a while around town in Portland. We talk about it, and then Frank and I have chat, uh, G chat about things. Because with Captain Midnight, like I was saying before, I try and put as much of that stuff in there as I can. So <clears throat> whenever I have an idea or a way I can do it, I'll ask my editor or somebody and uh, see if they'll let me do it or not. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And with connecting it all under this Project mm -hmm. Black Sky initiative, especially when you know, we know so very little about Project mm -hmm. Black Sky, generally speaking, uh, I mean, I assume everybody here is on the same page as to what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or are you at different levels? We're sure going to find out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you think it is? <laughs> Dark Horse has meetings every Friday uh, where they talk about it. They have a big board. There's a, there's a huge board in the office that has... Uh, their their plan they're mapped out and it's really interesting. And if you see it in three days, you die. Yeah, <laughs> it's really scary. Yeah, and Mike Richardson has a plan. I mean, Mike. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever read it, but Mike has like a yeah, huge I read Bible. The Bible. Bible. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's there's been multiple versions of it, but it's 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 funny to see all this stuff and then see uh, changes to the Bible based on stuff we're doing in the books. That's that thing you gave me, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was, like, <laughs> He handed that to me while I was drawing the occultist, and I looked at it, I was like, do I need to know this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just yeah. drawing a guy at a cape, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got to be on the same page, Mike. Okay, I know. <laughs> but, I mean, I think it still works, mm -hmm. certainly, and all the, all the different little seeded references definitely yeah. help make the books feel like they have a connected tissue. Mm -hmm. Well, Dark Horse, the editors of Dark Horse, they really are on top of it and keeping track. Like I said, they have meetings every week where they, they go over it, and they see how they can make... Uh, things work even at like books coming out the same month. They want to see if there's ways of making connections. Mm. It does make it feel like really fun and like it's part of something. And I think that's what a lot of people like about uh, Marvel and DCU stuff that it feels like part of something bigger. It's not so isolated. And it's cool coming in writing that, that you have that stuff to fall back on and include it. It's much more than just someone saying, like, oh, Captain Midnight. It's, it's again a lot of like corporations, a lot of mystery, mm -hmm. and things you can really just use to support your own storylines. And I'm excited to see where it goes even further from this as we're mm -hmm. really building to it. Because we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. I've been talking about this since the spring of 2011. Oh my god, okay, longer oh, wow. than me. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> that, that was the first time uh, I was given stuff and was like, what do you want to do about Captain Midnight? Yeah, <laughs> Blackout uh, came right out of the original version of the Bible, mm -hmm. that the Dark Horse Bible, not the real Bible. <laughs> or no. <laughs> the original version of the Bible. I must have missed that chapter. <laughs> Featured uh, blackout prominently. The word according yeah. to Richardson. <laughs> well, that is exactly 
<laughs> but no, uh, it's it's cool and it's real fun to include that stuff in. And yeah, when I was a kid, my favorite thing to read was uh, team up books. Like I love when characters would appear in each other. And yeah. if you look at the old Marvel stuff, you know you would have an issue of Spider Man where Daredevil would be in the background or whatever. Like I like that kind of thing where it's subtle but it's still this like connective tissue. And that's why with with Captain Minute, I, I yeah put all that stuff in there. That's mm. the stuff I like. You know, it's just for fun. But I also imagine that in like things. comics where yeah. everybody's kind of used to the the one set of shared universes mm -hmm. that coming in and being like the new kid on the block is also kind of fun and mm -hmm. exciting and refreshing. You get yeah. to push people around. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Be the bully. And there's certainly more that I think you can do with the books as well. There's less mm -hmm. restrictions. Because, uh, you know, Count Midnight, yeah. the, the last issue of it was pretty brutal. Yeah. The occultist it's, itself, like we were saying earlier, is kind of dark. Well, I think that's the thing with all those other books, you know, when we talk about the bigger superhero universes, is that they are limited. They can't, uh, they can't do as much. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do those sort of things that uh, we're able to get away with because we're a new universe and different set of rules. Uh, it's a lot of fun, I guess, to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to worry about it. Like, it can be closure with our books. You know, I have a plan for Captain Midnight, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's really cool to know that by the time I'm done writing Captain Midnight, I'll have told you know, of a complete story. Like you could read that and then still read the Black Skies and everything else, but you could still read this thing. And I think it sometimes can be hard to do because someone's gonna pick up after you or there's somebody before you. But with this, I feel like I'm able to tell um, a complete standalone story of Captain Midnight by the time I'm done. Mm -hmm. and I think the, the books that do minis as well, that's, that's great for that. What were you gonna say? No, I was gonna say, I mean, that's the thing is like, we're not, you know, when you're dealing with the big two, those are like long-running corporate icons that you know mm -hmm. spider-man's webs look a certain way and they have to look right and they have to be what they are you know every everyone's voices are so well entrenched and established whereas for us you know you know like with manuel who drew um who drew skyman for us like you know he got to redesign a costume that he liked the costume that he wanted to draw um and so therefore he's really good at drawing it because he designed it himself mm -hmm. um you know and we don't have you know my my many starts with the story in one place and then goes in a total, like by the end, all the characters are in different places. Everyone, you know, the world changes yeah. because of this book and there was never a moment of like, and then at the end, everything goes back to normal. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's, cause back that's not, baseline. that's not what we're doing. And that's what, you know, if you go back and you look at, you know, Marvel in the sixties, like that's what they did that was different. Like that's what they did that made people excited about those books is that when a character dies, when Gwen Stacy died, Gwen, no spoilers, um, <laughs> when Gwen Stacy died, it, it like changed that he will never get over the fact that Gwen Stacy died, even though he once had an affair with a clone of her, who might be his daughter, right? <laughs> you, you weren't there yet. You were gone. Uh, no. Yeah. That was, that was, but that's the thing. Before but, me, I think. but like, I joke, but like, that's the thing about those books is like, and I, I look, I love it, and I make a lot of money writing those books, but. The reality is that you like do? you're you're not a lot. I make like an average amount of money. If you, if you <laughs> aggregate it all together over time, over the years I've been doing it, it's like a decent. It's okay. I could like maybe maybe buy a car with all of it. Um, but like the thing about those books is that you do you have you have these kind of boundaries of not just the continuity, but also that they're owned by corporations. Also by you know they have to look how they look in the movies to some degree because you want people to read the books. You know, so we have we have a level of flexibility and freedom that you just don't have. No, and, and not that the other companies don't care about making great comics. What, what's nice about the Dark Horse line is that that's all the, that that's really all they care about. You know, we're not beholden to a larger IP holder or a larger corporate parent that, that's always looking, you know, a, a, one one you know over here to what the film people are going to think. And every, that's very nice. every job you do is a box, right? Like you're given you're given a box and told these are the restrictions of what you're doing, and you accept the box and you, you can like the box and you can hate the box, but you're always in a box. With what we're doing, that box is very big. It's very spacious. I could probably, you know, live in there for a couple weeks. And, you know, I've been thinking about putting in a shower. Um, you park Dark Horse has a ball. big box. Yeah, they have saying. a big box. Well, and I was a lot of say, room in there. Having it's a really universe neat. that grows out of our decisions is really exciting, too. Like, you didn't come mm -hmm. in with, and, and we say there was, like, a universe Bible, but it wasn't like, this is what happens. It was just, like, a lot of initial thought and ideas that went in that we've been able to completely, like, explode and push forward and... That's why it's changing, and that's really fun to not feel locked into someone else's outlines, to not feel that this is the way it has to be, that we're growing something from a new point. And uh, it makes every decision feel good because you know that the universe can accommodate it rather than 
push back and be yeah. like, oh, we're going to have to like make that all a dream or retcon everything that happened. Okay, yeah. you guys are really late. You guys are coming in right now, <laughs> yeah. so we have to start the panel over again. They heard yeah. Frank so, talking. Can we go to the front, the, yeah. <laughs> we go to the front of the PowerPoint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so Roger Black Sky. <laughs> well, now that everybody's here, I would like to actually open it up to questions, if anybody has one. Um, and we do have a nice little microphone in the center of the room. You can ask these guys anything that what you want. What is this panel is not an allowed <laughs> question. It's yeah. not an allowed question. No, Riding the dark horse. I want to see what's next. What, what's the next know, panel right? that you guys are here for? Is it Buffy or something? Or Josh Whedon? Image. Oh, oh, sex oh, oh it's the panel. comedy panel. <laughs> Never heard of them. What Never heard of them, yeah. Well, I think you, you guys know some jokes, right? We could start <laughs> it off. Two guys walk into a bar. <laughs> That's a horrible joke. <laughs> <laughs> the second one says, ow. <laughs> We'll explain it to you later. <laughs> I just got fired from comics. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Williamson told me that joke. Yeah. <laughs> I was drunk. <laughs> all right, well, one, one, one of the other questions. Oh, there's a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I see there. Please, go ahead. Hi. Uh, so, with Ghost and uh, the Call of Duty Ghost, what would be the magic side of this universe? And then everything else seems to be very technological based. Uh, is there going to be some crossover conflict there eventually, or is There's that be a, is that part of what you're teasing that you can't really talk about? Uh, <laughs> issue 16 of Captain Midnight, there'll be werewolves. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, technically, go I mean, Ghost is not supernatural magic. Like it is based in technology. Uh, I mean, we still. Like, because heaven has been scientifically proven. So. Yes. So it's, it's uh, <laughs> but it's all, yeah, like, when we talk about, like, demons and ghosts, like, it's all very scientifically based. Uh, I mean, you know, within reason. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was one thing I had to be, be drawn back on, because as soon as I hear, I went to Catholic school for 12 years, so as soon as I hear, like, demons, like, then I instantly go to heaven or hell, so... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like uh, there's still the link there. Uh, I don't think there's any like clear dividing line. And Ghost is one of my uh, favorite Dark Horse characters. Uh, I was a big fan of the book back when I was a kid, and they've been doing a good job of it. I've definitely said if we do a, a cultist Ghost crossover, I'm in. So if it ever happens, I'm I'm down. I as well. I'm not. Mike's out. <laughs> uh, first off, I want to say that what you guys are doing is really incredible. I'm, I'm reading all of it. I love all of it. Uh, and I love Thank the you. subtlety. I'm, I'm you know, sick of what you guys are saying about like the big two, reading like two issues of something and having it hijacked by some event that you have to buy like 20 issues to get the whole story, that kind of stuff. And so that's, that's really great. That's coming. Mm -hmm. Second know, of all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It's I was like giggling to myself. Soon. That's okay. Like, well, we'll get there. You guys, we'll get there. You guys can ease me into it. That's there's a, fine. There's pushback on my Blackest Night crossover idea. Blackout. <laughs> Blackout is Someone did that? Uh, second second thing, I think it's really funny that you guys are using the word universe when Mike Richardson's been saying world, world, world for everything and trying to move away from the word universe. Oh, we're <laughs> all people so are just fired. Like, whatever. <laughs> I already finished writing mine, so I can say whatever. I'm good. And, then, uh, and then for a question, um, because these are properties or, or characters that have existed before, even though you're, you're building it now, do you guys have plans for when your arc wraps up, or if you were going to hand it off to a different writer or a different artist who wanted to do their take on it, is, is there a lot of freedom there for the next generation of people that would possibly be writing these characters? Um, I have a plan, because I mean, we're, <clears throat> we're working on year three uh, in terms of like outlines and scripts right now for Captain Midnight, mm -hmm. uh, which is really far out, considering <laughs> Nine just came out. Just to show you, I mean, we're, we're really far ahead planning things. Um, I'm working on issue three, so. <laughs> you really? Jesus. Um, I have a plan for the end, and it, 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 it will wrap up everything I wanted to do, but I would hope that someone could pick up from that and go forward. Yeah. I would, someone would have to, if they want to do call this, they got to get my permission. That's fine. <laughs> no, they don't, actually. I, don't. <laughs> I do think it would be weird, because Captain Midnight is probably, it's a, in terms of somebody else's character, like with most of my creator own stuff, that stuff's very personal to me. But there's a weird thing with Captain uh, Midnight where it's like I've been working on it for so long, um, and you know, it's been a part of my life for you know, yeah, we're talking about three years now. Um, it would be weird, I think, in a way, to see somebody else work on it at this point, like uh, like like fully take over where I had nothing to do with it at all. I think it'd be weird, but at the same time, it would be awesome to see what somebody else would do with it, like. Uh, uh, 
Fred did the the free comic book day book, and I like I told you already, like I love the script for that. Like the interaction between Brand Boy and Captain Midnight were perfect. It was, so it was, it was kind of cool to see that. Yeah, I, I I'm a big fan of the Captain Midnight book, and it was fun to sort of have because Matt has a contempt for old people, like old teenagers. So that's pretty <laughs> much the theme of their relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, Brain Boy definitely has a distinct three act structure. The the Gestalt book is the second act. The third act, however, may uh, show up in a different book. So we'll see. <clears throat> and I think if you do your job right as a writer, especially coming in with a new character, there should be enough there that someone should be able to pick up on it. I mean, if we talk about so many of these older characters that have been around, you know how they would react in a room. And as a writer, I, with, with Blackout specifically, I really want someone to take it over. They should understand who it is. I should have enough in there that they feel like a real person. So with the development of a new shared universe, what are some of the things that, with, from your work at other companies, that you're specifically looking to avoid as you build this new universe? Working with Josh Fialkov is something I was trying to avoid. Done <laughs> 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 a pretty good job of that so far. I think the important thing whenever you're building, because the problem is, is, is I think too often, you know, when, when Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko were doing the Marvel comics, they didn't, I mean, you know, occasionally Thor would pop up and been fantastic for it, like, go read Thor's book, you know, and, and there, wasn't, there wasn't an obsession with making sure everything is logical and everything sort of fits together. I, I like sort of the messy act of creation, and I think what's, what's nice is that because the books are all, have a very sort of subtle theme, but, but we're allowed to sort of do our own thing, you know, I think a universe should be grown organically from, you know, uh, inside out rather than looking down on it and trying to make everything fit. That's more of a, you know, it's kind of like if you actually tried to write the official handbook for the Marvel Universe before there was a Marvel Universe. Um, it, it's putting the cart before the horse. And yeah, I think, like, uh, I mean, at least I personally, like, I think it, you should be able to pick up any book that you want and not, like, feel like, okay, well, in order to truly get this book, then I have to pick up this book. Like, uh, it should, like, if, if you like one, then the possibility stands you'll like all the others, but there's no, like, you have to do this in order to understand this, because I hate that, so I don't want to do that. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> wow. Well, <clears throat> guys, I want to thank our moderator today, Mr. Matt Malikoff from Multiversity <laughs> Comics. <laughs> And our Project Black Sky A team, Mr. Frank and Josh and Tim and Mike and Chris over there and that Frank or Fred guy, whatever his name is, and uh, Josh. Good. Perfect. Before we go, I want to invite all of you out to a little shindig we're having tonight at Rock Bottom Brewery. If you're 21 and over, we will all be there having a nice little benefit uh, for a friend of ours, Mr. Stan Sakai. Uh, and um, he's a great, great man. You saw Gio Jimbo. Come on, everybody. And uh, also the Hero Initiative. So uh, if you're if you're down, come on out after the show. Oh well, yeah. And if you want to talk to these guys and get some stuff signed and check out Project Black Sky for yourself, we will have them signing at the Dark Horse booth, 206, top floor, not in this weird nether region that we're in. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and they'll be there at 3:30. So, rock and roll. Yep. Nice. Thanks, everybody. It's not up
Hi, my name is Tamar. I'm your panel min uh, minion for this particular day. I just want to thank all of you for coming to Emerald City Comic Con 2014. Um, yay! <laughs> Uh, just a couple things. Just remember, we are streaming live on Flip TV, so make sure all your cell phones are on vibrate or silent. If you are going to leave the panel room, please try not to slam the door. Please don't make phone calls. I know all these guys are freaking awesome, but kind of keep it down till we leave. Um, other than that, please enjoy yourself, and thank you once again for attending Emerald's <laughs> Emerald. <laughs> wow. Okay, everybody just saw that on, <laughs> on, on the web. I think Thank they're you. gonna zoom in on you, Chip. It'll be good. Why are we even here when there's a guy with a sandwich in his hand? That's the most interesting thing about the panel so it far. Is. How y'all doing today? You good? <laughs> <laughs>